the 1982 uh, National Farmers Convention here in Louisville, Kentucky. We want to thank the gracious hosts uh, here in Kentucky, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy their southern hospitality uh, while you're in Louisville. My name is Lee Elliott, and it's my job is uh, to be master of ceremonies tonight. I don't know if you know the definition of a master of ceremonies or not, but uh, uh, if just for those that don't, it's a fellow that uh, is a master at cluttering things up. He don't have enough up here to be able to get up and give a good speech, so when he's asked to put on a meeting, he hunts up some fellows that can give a rip roar and speech and puts one together, and we've got three of the doggone speakers here tonight that, uh, that you're ever going to wish uh, uh, that you could hear. We've got... Uh, uh, John Weefold from Minnesota, who some of you know. We got Jack Crowner, uh, who's a local radio and television personality. And Jim Harrington, who is a banker from Coldwater, Kansas. Now, we're going to set a few ground rules before we start. Uh, they're... Uh, uh, been instructed about how long they're to speak, and uh, then they're going to field questions from the audience for five to seven minutes, uh, each one after they speak. And then, uh, since we've got a captive audience, you couldn't blame us if we work in a little commercial but once in a while between speakers. Is that okay? <laughs> All right, so... Uh, we're going to start. I'm going to ask uh, Dave Kozacek to, to give the invocation, please. So if you would stand, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Lee. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to bless this group of tillers of the soil and herdsmen as we have our first public meeting of our 1982 convention. We have many hungry brethren around the world that are deprived of the precious gift of food that we in this country have been blessed with such an abundance of. Many of our producers are in dire straits and in danger of losing ownership of their farms and the ability to have this massive production that we have. In, the, in Paul's second epistle to Timothy, he states that the husbandman that laboreth must first partake of the fruits. We ask for your divine guidance for, the, for we as leaders of this organization to make the right decisions and guide us in the right direction that that may happen, that the husbandman that laboreth will partake of the first fruits of his labor. Amen. The theme for the 1982 convention is bargaining is more than marketing. You know, there's two things that really make a difference. One of them is people and the other is attitude. I think W.C. Stone said it very well when he said, there's very little difference in people, but that little difference makes a big difference. The little difference is attitude. The big difference is whether it's positive or negative. Now, the, the thing about national farmers is we've got the best people in the world. And we know what their attitude is or they wouldn't be here. So, <laughs> Now, for the first speaker of the evening, Needs no introduction. I'll guarantee you he don't have any trouble with attitude. He's a fellow I'm glad to work with just about every day. A fellow that I'm very proud to be heading this organization. So it gives me great pleasure in introducing the president of National Farmers Organization, Devon Woodland. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's the trouble you get into. Uh, uh, John says, now, who is he introducing? <laughs> You know, Lee's been around a long time. Lee is probably one of the senior members of the staff in the organization, and the history of the organization is very uh, vivid in his memory. He's one of the few that can tell you just how big that pile of Sears and Roebuck catalogs was. Back there when they were piled up around, uh, he tells me they were 15 feet high and 40 feet long. 40 feet across. 40 feet across. <laughs> Lee, he has a lot of that, uh, that history in his background. I've got to tell you this, you know, it's been an active day today, and when you meet with members of the press uh, every few minutes, uh, you begin to wonder what you have said and what uh, you might have said that they didn't interpret right. Tonight, when we got through one of the last press conferences, one of them said to me, what do you really think about the Reagan administration? <laughs> and I said, well, it's this simple. The president talks about the trickle-down theory. Farmers feel like they have experienced, what did I say? <laughs> the tinkle-down theory. Well, what's new as far as the NFO is concerned? We've got, to my left, we've got a banker. To my right, we've got an educator. And I've always wondered which would last longer, the brains or the money. <laughs> John, he's chancellor of the university system in Minnesota. And Mr. Harrington, he's affiliated with the Independent Bankers Association. Tonight, we're going to see who uh, lasts the longest, brains or money. Now, we've got both available to us. As we take and consider the NFO and where we're going, what might be new and what might have changed, there ought not to be anything happening today that is new as far as you and I are concerned. If you have followed the information, the lectures, those who preceded me by many, many years as to what was really taking place. You remember the CED report back in 1962 when they outlined exactly what they were going to do. And they have followed it nearly to the letter. The only burr under the saddle has been this organization and your determination, your commitment to a cause of people. And so these things that are happening today, we have forestalled them. They have been postponed because of what you and others like you have done. But all of these things have been scheduled. They have been programmed out where they would discourage young people from entering to, into agriculture as owners and operators. But they would cause a mass migration of people. They scheduled it much quicker than it's happening. But you're seeing today a migration. And it probably has not bottomed out, in my opinion. The farm credit people have been lenient with borrowers. They have been willing to renew, to carry over, to roll over unpaid capital loans. How long can they do it? I don't know. But at some point, there must be some corrective action taken in the marketplace because there is a limit. And when that point will be reached, yet remains to be known. So we're here tonight to listen to people whom we have invited in to give us a perspective from a little broader point of view than we see within our own spectrum. And it's a thrill to be here tonight in the first public session of our convention and have this information as a background, as a basis to build the theme, the attitude of this convention. Welcome, and we'll be seeing more of each other in the next few days as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Devon. Now it's time for a commercial. 
The fellow that I'm going to introduce, uh, when I ask him about saying a few words here tonight, he says, now, don't give me a flowery introduction. He says, you've got to remember, he says, I'm not a public speaker. He says, I'm a journalist. But I want to tell you, you don't see much of Arlo Jacobson uh, uh, around NFO a lot, but you do a lot of reading of a lot of his writing because Arlo is editor of the NFO Reporter. If you remember... Uh, down through the years, the very few good articles uh, before the last several years that we got out of the Des Moines Register, they were written by Arlo Jacobson. He's been a journalist for a little over 30 years, and he spent 14 years as the agribusiness editor of the Des Moines Register. So it gives me pleasure to introduce the editor of the NFO Reporter, Arlo Jacobson. Thank you, Lee. I, uh, I enjoy this public relations work for the National Farmers Organization, and one of the things that makes it really interesting is that tinkle down theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say a personal hello to all the people here who work in public relations for NFO at the state, county, and district level. I'd like to invite everybody here to stop by the news booth on the convention floor but I'd like to ask those PR people to stop by our news headquarters on the mezzanine to say hello. We're going to have a yellow pad here, and I'd like you all to sign your names and your home addresses so we can get an idea of how many are here. And I'd also like to, if enough of you express an interest in it, we'll set up a meeting for the public relations people, just a little rump session when things are a little bit slow, and we'll get together and try and figure out some better ways to become more effective in telling the NFO story. Thank you for being here to help make this a successful meeting, and do stop by and see us. Thank you. Thank you, Arlo. Now, for the next speaker, I don't really know any jokes about college professors or PhDs, so I'm going to really have to get down to business here. Uh, this next speaker is no stranger to those of you from Minnesota and, and some of the surrounding states because John Weefold has been a very avid speaker in the support of rural America for many years. And he's got a pedigree that is so long I couldn't remember it, so I'm going to read it to you if you'll forgive me. Uh, uh, Dr. Weefold was appointed chancellor of the Minnesota State University System in August the 30th, 1982, and assumed the position on October the 18th, 1982. He has been in the state university system for the past five years as president of Southwest State University in Marshall, Minnesota. Previously, he served more than six years as Minnesota's 22nd commissioner of agriculture. Before taking the agricultural post, he taught history at August Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota for five years. In addition, he had teaching fellowships at the University of Michigan, and Washington State University. Dr. Weefold earned his bachelor's degree in history and political science from the Pacific uh, Lutheran University, Tacoma, Washington, in 1959, and his master's degree in the same fields from Washington State University in 1961. He earned his doctorate in history from the University of Michigan in 1965, a native and third generation Minnesotan of Norwegian ancestry, <laughs> Dr. Weefold has deep roots in the land and in public service. He is a dedicated spokesman for rural America, and under his direction, Southwestern State University developed an innovative rural studies program which offers students the opportunity to study, understand, and appreciate their rural heritage and contemporary life. Gives me great pleasure to once again introduce John Weefold. Thank you. Lee, thank you very much. It is a real honor and privilege 
to be here in Louisville, Kentucky, to speak to so many strong supporters of the National Farmers Organization. You might be wondering why an educator like myself, the chancellor of the Minnesota State University System, the representative of seven different and important state universities in an important state like Minnesota, would be here in Louisville tonight to talk to the National Farmers Organization. Well, the truth is, I love the National Farmers Organization. Do you like and love the National Farmers Organization? When I stop to think of my feelings here tonight in terms of what the National Farmers Organization has done for me and many of the individuals that I've met over the years, I have to kind of think for a moment of a little history. I have to think of those years, 1954 and 1955, when this organization was born. And I have to think of the countless thousands of men and women who over a period of time put their heart and soul into this fledgling organization so that farmers would be more adequately represented, certainly for themselves, in the marketing structure of the United States of America. And I think of some of the activities in 1959 and 1961. I think of that memorable meeting in Des Moines, Iowa, on August 28, 1962, at the Veterans Memorial Hall in Des Moines, where 20,000 National Farmers Organization farmers from all over the country got together to protest low farm prices. I think about the holding action in August of 1964, and I'm sure that many of the people here tonight were there, were there when it was not easy to represent and champion American farmers and ranchers. Or in 1967, on the dairy front, or in 1968 in terms of the whole beef industry and National Farmers Organization farmers and ranchers protesting the treatment to our cattle and livestock industry. So here we are in 1982 with a vital and important farm organization called the National Farmers Organization. An organization that is geared up to not only represent the dreams and aspirations of millions of American farmers throughout our history, but to provide a bargaining structure a marketing organization to achieve for the American farmer not only fair prices, but justice and liberty for all Americans. Isn't that right? I have a number of degrees, you know, the BA, the MA, and the PhD. But I must say, it wasn't until I met some National Farmers Organization farmers in Minnesota that I started to get really smart. <laughs> I personally do not believe that I would be here tonight speaking to you as Chancellor of the State University System if it wasn't for what I learned from farmers and ranchers in Minnesota, especially in the National Farmers Organization in terms of economics. For years, I was taught that Keynesian economics was the answer to all of our nation's ills. And that is the old business of government fine-tuning the economy, raising interest rates or lowering interest rates, raising government spending or lowering government spending, or manipulating the money supply through the Federal Reserve System. And the Keynesian economists basically have had their way since World War II. 
But they have been joined by other economists that we call the supply siders, who believe that if taxes go lower, that those people, businesses, and individuals will invest in whatever business, and then America will move on and become prosperous. Then we have the monetarists who believe that the money supply determines the nation's health or the nation's economic woes. Well, it wasn't until I ran across some National Farmers Organization farmers who said, you know, these economists out there, Keynesians, monetarists, supply siders, they've all forgotten about George Washington. They've all forgotten about Thomas Jefferson. That all of these economists in the post-World War II period have forgotten about agriculture, our most important industry. <laughs> and so these National Farmers Organization farmers like Pete Nagel and Hugh Crane and Dick Wallenhaus and Norm Larson, people that I got to know in 65 and 1966, they reminded me of a central truth that I think all economists ought to think about. And that is if you take all of these economists, Republican and Democratic economists alike, in the political arena, and then just put them on a line end to end, guess what? They reach no conclusion. <laughs> so with these farmers like Pete Nagel, and Hugh Crane. You know, there are people here in the audience tonight that have taught me a lot about economics too, but they're the first two that I really ran into back in the middle 1960s. Now, I don't want you to forget them because those two people represented courage and dedication and heart when it wasn't easy. And when those people would sit down and explain to others who were not in the agricultural community, the concept of new wealth and earned income and the multiplier effect, that when farmers make a decent living, not only do they prosper, but ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America becomes unstoppable. So here we are, 1982, and this organization is geared up and has the structure and the capacity and the people and the ideas and the integrity and the professionalism and the ability to put together blocks of commodities to establish a fair price for America's farmers. But how did this organization get to this point? Well, on the backs of some giants, some people that will be remembered when we think about Williams Jennings Bryan and Robert La Follette and Washington and Jefferson and Andrew Jackson and George Norris of Nebraska. I have a feeling that Butch Swain is going to be remembered in that same group. Butch Swain, who put in countless years of his life for the National Farmers Organization. What about Arnold Red Paulson? Hey, Arnold, wherever you are, God bless you. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Business person from Granite Falls not even a farmer, and no one educated the American people and the farmer in seminar after seminar than the legendary and great Arnold Red Paulson. You know, it isn't often that you can talk about a giant, you know, who's still around. But there's another person who hasn't missed 
many National Farmers Organization meetings on the county level, on the state level, on the national level, who whenever a county chairperson wanted him, he was there. He was there with heart and vision and compassion. And somebody that we will forever owe a debt of gratitude, the one and only Earhart Finkston. <laughs> Earhart. Earhart. <laughs> Earhart, thank you so much. We will never forget the many, many contributions for your people and this great farm organization. And you know, we can't fail to mention the other one. I mean, the one who I'm sure a hundred years from now will have to be rated in the same breadth as George Norris and Williams Jennings Bryan. And that's really the person more than any other single individual who had the dream in 53, 54, and 55 and where we are here tonight. Let's give a big hand to Orrin Lee Staley. So here we are tonight with a very, very professional farm organization with Devon Woodland, who I've known for many years. You couldn't find anybody more decent, more honest, more understanding, more compassionate, and a person better suited for the times to run this National Farmers Organization. And let's give Devon Woodland a real big hand. You would think that John was a politician. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> Myself. As I was coming in the door here tonight, I saw one of my Minnesota NFO friends from long standing, and I said, oh, you're at another National Farmers Organization meeting. He said, yeah, I've almost been at as many as you have. <laughs> but you know, I, I really am happy to be here tonight with Bob Arndt. My, my good friend, there's a, another indefatigable worker for the National Farmers Organization. I call him in Echo, Minnesota, talk to his dear wife. He's never home. I mean, he's never home. And I tell you, you know, people who are in politics think they've got a career. They ought to join the National Farmers Organization, see what it's really like. But we're certainly grateful to Bob Arndt and all of the people that make up this first rate and impressive and outstanding farm organization in America in 1982. Well, let me just spend a, a minute talking about the importance of agriculture today. You know, many people don't give us any credit anymore because there aren't as many of us left. You know, in 1940, 20% of the American people still resided on the farms and ranches of America, about 20%. And now we're down to about 3%. Nevertheless, with all of those wrenching and mind-boggling and heartbreaking changes that have cost millions of farmers their livelihood, as we have watched six million farmers go down to fewer than three million. As we have watched the largest out-migration of peoples in the history of the world, and that's from the farm and small town America to the big cities, even with all of those changes, as we get down to 1982, the people who are here tonight still represent the most important industry in America. You know, a lot of these economists don't realize that we still represent $1.2 trillion. 
In terms of total assets, American agriculture is the equivalent of Fortune Magazine's top 500 corporations that we hear all the time on the news with CBS and ABC and NBC and all of our daily newspapers about this Fortune Magazine corporation and this multinational conglomerate and all of the rest. And when automobile sales suffer, we hear about it on the nightly news. And yet when America's farmers take the short end of the stick, it's just buried away on page 13 or we might see and hear a little bit about it on the local news at about 27 minutes after the hour. And that's really unfortunate because America's farmers represent an industry that's greater than that of all of the automobile, the steel, and the transportation companies put together. So we represent 20% of the national economy, and indeed in most of our states, like Minnesota, agriculture and the total food and fiber industry represent 40% of Minnesota's economy, and you get into the Dakotas and Montana and Iowa, it's 50 and 60 and 70% of our state's economic well-being. Well, what it all goes to show is that if anybody understands American history, with any comprehension. If American agriculture does well, guess what? America does well. If our farmers make money, our rural business people make money. If our farmers make money, our states do well. If our farmers and ranchers just make a halfway decent rate of return on investment, the United States of America does well. You know, people say, well, if farm prices go up, that'll be inflationary. <laughs> well, that's what a lot of economists think and believe. And yet, my friends, from 1942 to 1952, when farmers were making good money for every one of those years, when farmers indeed for that decade were making 100% of parity, we paid for World War II, and from 1946 to 1953, when the war was all over, for every one of those years under Harry S. Truman of Missouri, guess what? We didn't have inflation. We didn't have runaway costs. We didn't have unemployment, inflation, and recession. When farmers made money under Harry Truman, America had full production, full employment, and a balanced budget. Whether it was Butch Swain, or Earhart Finkston, or Red Paulson, or Vince Rossiter, Nebraska, or Orrin Lee Staley. We've been saying now for 20 years, you can't keep treating American agriculture like this. You can't keep slapping the American farmer in the face. You can't keep driving American agriculture into more and more debt and less and less income. Oh, you can do it, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. Eventually, that three-legged stool of which capital and labor and raw materials make for that firm foundation of one of those legs on that stool becomes weakened and unstable. The economy is going to crash. Yeah, we said that in 1960. We said it in 1970. We said it in 1980. We said it every year in between. And so we had 100% of parity from 42 to 52, and America was unstoppable. And then with Ezra Taft Benson and the whole sliding scale, we went into the cheap food philosophy of the 1950s. And we went into a cheap food philosophy that was adopted by both political parties. And increasingly, they've been putting that cheap food philosophy into place, thinking that this would benefit America and the consumers and the politicians. And so parity from 52 to 1960 falls down to 84%. And then from 61 to 68, it goes down to 77%.
Then from 69 to 76, when we had three great years, 72, 73, and 74, it's now down to 75%. And then from 1976 to 1980, showing that it's a nonpartisan situation. As the President of the United States leaves in January of 1981, parity is now down to about 66%. And that wasn't good enough. So today, I'm sorry to say, parity is now down to in a story, low, about 55%. How low is that? In 1932, the lowest year for parity between 1914 and 1982. I'm talking about the Depression. I'm talking about the Depression. Under Hoover, parity was 58%, the lowest ever until this past year when it went down to 55%. And then the politicians and the economists cannot figure out why we have inflation and recession and unemployment and underemployment. They can't treat the American farmer like that for too much longer and get by with it, period. In 1947, net farm income was $17 billion. And you didn't have for rent and for sale signs on the businesses of rural America. In 1947, $17 billion. And now, for 1982, the United States Department of Agriculture is forecasting net farm income of $17 billion. How low is that? Well, once again, if you take the total assets of agriculture, it's about $1.2 trillion. Take the total assets of Fortune Magazine top 500 corporations, about $1.2 trillion. Well, let's compare farmers to Fortune Magazine's top 500 in terms of rate of return on investment. Just to show you why we are where we are in 1982. Well, in 1981, Fortune Magazine's top 500 did not have a good year. Uh, not a good year. 1981, their net income was $80 billion. That's on $1.2 trillion. Farmers in 1981, on their $1.1 trillion, received a handsome $18 billion. So just think about this for a minute. Here we are, the one industry that is capable of producing new wealth and earned income. Multiplier effects six to seven times. We're sitting there at 18 billion, Fortune magazines at 80 billion, and then people wonder about this three-legged stool why America's economy is shaking and rolling and heaving, kind of like the Titanic. You know, if they would just give us double 18 billion, which would be one third of what Fortune Magazine's top 500, you would begin to see a rebounding of America's economy like we haven't had in years. If we got half of what the multinational top 500 Fortune Magazine's got, just half of what they got based on the same asset base, guess what? Within one year, President Reagan could come on national television and say, Hey, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in 20 years, America has balanced its budget. Well, we have people who've got the answers, though. They say we need to export more, huh? Devine, you just had an article on the NFO Reporter, this last issue. Well, there are people who say, don't worry about prices. Let's just export more. OK, we've done that. Back in 1972, we exported about $7 billion worth. As of 1982, it's right around $44 billion. So Devon, as you point out, a 600%, not six, or 60, 600% increase in exports from 72 to 82. And guess what? 
we're holding the bag. <laughs> Guess what? Farm debt has increased from 15 to 16 billion in 72 to 190 billion in 1982. Exports, exports. Yeah, if you're working for Cargill, Continental, and Bungie. <laughs> oh, there are other people who say free trade. Free trade is the answer. We have to unshackle American agriculture. What do you think we've been doing since 1972? Free trade. Now, how do you have free trade with Japan? How do you have free trade with a, a country that has its own national corporation that buys your corn and your soybeans? Let's say they buy our corn for two and a half. I wish we could get two and a half. But let's say the Japanese national government, their buying company, buys it for three dollars. You know what they do? They turn around and sell it to their processors and their buyers for about $9. All those Japanese. I just wonder who won World War II. <laughs> well, I mean, how do you do with free trade, you know, when you're dealing with the Western Europeans and the common market countries? Now, am I taking too much time here? This is going to be one of the shortest speeches I've ever given to a National <laughs> Farmers Organization meeting, I'll tell you that. Well, how do you deal with free trade in the Western European common market countries, the European economic community? So what do they do with our corn? Let's say we sell our corn in 1980 for $3 a bushel. You know what they do? They tax that corn at $3 a bushel. They tax it not at a dollar, a dollar and a half. You know, they're not that nice. No, they add three dollars tax onto our corn. Same way with wheat. They just double the price and that is a tax. And guess what then? On your corn and soybeans, hey, come on now. On your corn and soybeans that we worked our hearts out for, they turn around through their government, subsidize their farmers, then to come back and haunt us in Latin America, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. Do I like that? Hell no, I don't like it. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> Take soybeans now. You know, they don't tax our soybeans. See, I mean, they allow us to, they export our soybeans into Western Europe. They don't tax that. So let's say we get about four and a half or five dollars on our soybeans, which they permit in without a tax. Like France, for example, turns around and gives a subsidy to that soybean grower in France of six or seven dollars so that their total income is like 12 or 13 dollars. You know, Block, I don't know, does that name ring a bell with you? <laughs> you know, this administration, and you know, I, I think I've been telling you that it hasn't really made much difference over the past 25 years, whether the Republicans or Democrats have been in power in terms of how they've treated the American farmer. But you know, the thing I can't understand is this administration and Block and all the rest, what they want to do is bring that European economic community to its knees. They want to take those farmers in France and Germany and bring them down to your level. Now, isn't that ridiculous? Let's get up to their level. <laughs> then there are people who say bigger is better. You have to be more efficient. You've got to add another quarter or another half a section. Then when you get real big, then you're going to be happy ever after. Well. We've been doing that since 1801. I didn't say 1901, since 1801. And that hasn't worked either. Well, what are we going to do? I mean, so we've talked about exports. We've talked about free trade. We've talked about bigger is better. You know what I think would help us? Income. Just a little old fair price. You know, like we had from 42 to 52. A fair price. 
just a halfway decent fair price that reflects, let's say, some element of purchasing power on your behalf. And for an industry that is capable of literally turning this country around, how can we do less? You know, if you people weren't important, I wouldn't even be up here tonight. I mean, if agriculture was just something that was irrelevant and just a footnote to our economy, then I would say, why come all the way to Louisville, Kentucky? But my friends, what you are doing here tonight and throughout this week, through the National Farmers Organization, yeah, you're helping yourselves. I appreciate that. You're helping your family. You're trying to help your community and county to make this farm organization the best ever and to put this farm organization in a position where finally, after all of these years,